Amen. So, say the healthy church, right? What's a healthy church? But I want to begin by asking these questions here. Uh, these two questions. One, what does a healthy church look like for you? When you say a healthy church, what do you mean? But now the question uh, what is what are you looking for in a church? When you say, uh, I'm looking for a church, what are you looking for? What, what does a good church look like for you? If you say, this is an ideal church for me, this is a good church for me, what do you mean? What are you looking for? And of course, I know for some people, they, they look for a place where there's beautiful music. And so there are those who are okay with three hours of singing and then ten minutes of preaching. The church is like that. They'll devote three hours to preaching, I mean to music, and then the time they're calling the pastor, they say, you have ten minutes. As a guest preacher, you have just introduced yourself, and then they'll bring your cheese and say, Pastor, please summarize. You have eight minutes. And so there are those for them that when they say church, they just want a place they can go and sing and dance. But for some, it's, it's a place where there's good preaching. Now, that some people when we say good preaching, they're, they're meaning preaching where we get to hear some of these messages that makes us comfortable. Where they're going to give us secrets on how to be wealthy and healthy and prosperous and how we can travel the world and how we can live a comfortable life. For others, they want a church where sin is not spoken about. Then they'll say, well, that, that's a good church. I like that. But when we say good preaching, good preaching has to be a preaching that is Bible-centered and it's spirit-led. It focuses on who Jesus Christ is, His death, burial, and resurrection, and what that means for us. Amen. So when you say, I want a church with good preaching, what are you meaning? What, what do you mean with good preaching? When you say you want a church with good music, what kind of music are you talking about? Because if the music and the worship is for God and His glory, then everything done ought to be about Him Amen. and His glory. Amen. Never about the ones singing. Never about the ones who are on the stage. It's Him. Amen. But there are others also, of course, who are looking for churches where it's made up of their peers. Where, you know, at least all my friends go to that church, therefore that's where I want to go. You know, that church is a church where uh, at least the people of my profession and people of my class go to. Therefore, that's where I want to go. Whether the rest of the things are fine or not, well, as long as I get to chill with my friends. That those were like that. And so they'll say, I don't like that church. Well, why? Well, I don't have friends there. Or two, well, the, the people there are not my class. They don't speak my language. But there are those who are looking for a place with opportunity to serve. There are those who say, you know, as a believer, I believe God has called me, God has saved me, and God has gifted me. And in this gifting that is given to me, uh, I want where I can exercise my spiritual gift. But there are those who are looking for a place where they are served, where they come and sit and not do anything. They want a place where they come and everything is done, service is done, they walk away, or they'll take care of that. As we say, we're looking for a good church, for a healthy church, what do you mean? Are you actively involved serving in the church you say, this is my church? But before I can even say that, do you have a church where you say, this is my church? Because there are people who are not committed into a fellowship. They sound that they are here. They sound that they are in another church. The third one, they are in another church. The fourth sound that they are in another church. And then, so this church will not see them for two months. And the other church has not seen them in two months. And the other one in two months. And so this church thinks, well, maybe they have just come for a visit. And then 
Four months later, you say, I'm, I'm here, I'm back. And there are people like that. Because they don't want to commit to a fellowship and they don't want to serve. So as we say, a healthy church, well, what do you mean? So what's a healthy church? What does it look like? I want to say this. I hope you're taking notes. I told you all the teaching and preaching in the process. See, as we strive to have a healthy church, it's not just the work of the pastor. It's not just the work of elders and the leadership. A healthy church requires that everyone who says, this is where we belong, this is where we fellowship from, that they're actively involved in the service. That they're actively involved in the worship of the Lord. They're actively involved in doing the work of the Lord. Every believer must. Be involved if we're going to have a healthy church it's not just the work of the pastor it's not just the work of leaders every believer but, but you see the problem with many of our churches and I say including Acacia is we have less than 10% who are serving and doing everything they're the ones who are doing the cleaning and the sweeping and the ones who are organizing here and singing and leading and all of that including setting the chairs and stocking the chairs and all of that. The rest of us kind of want to come and find everything ready and service is done and then we want to go. That's not healthy. But then, so, so the 90% 90, 90 of us are the one blaming and say, oh, they've not done this and they've not done this and that is not okay and the other is not okay. And no, it is not the work of the 10%. It is the work of all of us. Amen. And so if we say this is our church, each one of us must be responsible for it. I want to say something about our worship team. These guys commit already three days a week. They're here on Thursday, all the way up to sometime 8 p.m. And then they do the same on Saturday. And then Sunday morning they come, and they're the ones setting up this place, and they're the ones setting up there, and cleaning this place, and setting here, and then leading us in worship. And many of you don't know that. Yes. Many of you want to look at what they have not done right. Uh -huh. But I want to ask, what have you done to help? See, as a church, as a family, I shouldn't go and say, Dad, you've not done this right. This is not right. Before I do that, I need to ask myself, if I know it is wrong, if I know something could be done in a better way, what have I already done to help solve that? So striving for a healthy church is the work of everyone. And so that means every single one of us, and we need to know this, each one of us, who says we are disciples of Jesus will give an account before him an account and remember that we read a passage and we're getting back to it we're going to have to give an account before the Lord Paul tells us each one of us one by one how we lived our life what we did for the kingdom and how we did it if we did anything at all says each one of us must give an account. And so one will have to give an account on this. Have we gathered together regularly? Have we met together? You see, God did not just save you or save me so that I don't go to hell. The Bible tells us when you read Ephesians 2, of course verse 8 and 9 tells us, for by grace you've been saved through faith. Right? It's a gift of God, not a result of works, lest anyone should boast. But why did He save us? For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do the work that He prepared beforehand for us. Yeah. Peter says the same thing in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. He tells us, of course, in, in verse 7 he says, But you who believed in His name, He's made you a royal priest with a holy nation of people belonging to Him. But why did He do that? so that we proclaim the excellences of Him who saved us from darkness and brought us into His marvelous light. There's something that God has called all of us to doing. 
and, and he, we'll call the household of God the body of Christ. And so he does not save us so that I can now go and live in an island somewhere and wait to go to heaven. He wants us to be a part of a family, part of a fellowship. That's why he says, don't neglect meeting together. But secondly, we're going to give an account because we're called to star up one another. Have you, have you been involved in starring the church and encouraging the, the rest of the people on how to love and, and doing good works? It says we star one another. That's the call God is giving to us. Now, as, as we say this, so you already notice it's a collective responsibility. Each one of us is involved. We need to all be doing what God has called us to do. The Bible tells us, both in 1 Corinthians 12 through to 14, chapter 14, where, when it talks about spiritual gifts, in Romans it says the same thing in chapter 12 when it talks about spiritual gifts. It says God has a portion different spiritual gifts to different individuals for a purpose. It says so that as each member plays its role, the body is built together. Then it says, let me ask you, if the head is to say, well, I'm the one in church, I have the brain, and then the, the, the hands and the feet and the mouth and the eyes says, okay, if that's the case, you control everything then. It says, will the body be healthy? It says, no. It says, even the least of the members must be healthy and active if the body is going to be fine. And that's the same with the church, the body of Christ. It says, each member must be. And so he says, we need to stir one another up to love and good works. Loving God and loving one another and doing the good for His glory, but for the good of the fellowship. But then also, have we fought to maintain a right teaching, a right preaching, a right message of God's Word? If you're in a church where the Word of God, the Bible is not proclaimed, worship is not about God, and everything else, you're in the wrong church, you need to leave. If the Word of God is not proclaimed and given for what it is, you need to leave that church. Because you're in the wrong place. Because it is throughout, it is of all the different writings, everything that we have on earth, there's only one book that we find the Bible telling us, Pastor Grafe Theopnustos, that all Scripture has been inspired of God and given to us is useful, is profitable for what? For teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped. But equipped for what? For every good works. Amen. You notice that? Now you cannot work when you are just on an island. The work that He's called us to do is not for our benefit, it is for the benefit of the body and for His glory. And he says, we need the Word to be equipped for that. So it's very important that we're leaving. And so we get back to our passage. Let us hold fast the confession of our faith. Hold on to it. This confession you made that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of my life. The confession you made that I acknowledge that I'm a sinner and that Jesus Christ died for my sin. It says, let's hold on to that. But why and how? It says, hold on to it without wavering, without doubt, without letting go. Because He who promised, look at that, He who promised is faithful. Remember when, when Paul writes to believers in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, says, God who has called us into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ, is faithful. Amen. And so he says, let us hold on to this. You notice the call. He, he's not saying, let the leaders or let the... He says, all of us, let us, if we say we are believers and disciples, let us hold fast to the confession of our faith because he will promise is faithful verse 24 and let us consider doing what how to stir one another up to love and to good works let us consider 
how to start. You notice one another. Now you cannot have one another if you're by yourself. You cannot have one another when you're in your sitting room with a TV on. Amen. Or tuned onto a radio and you're just there. Because, you know, however comfortable it might be, the church on the sofa will never in any way replace the church in the pew. That's right. It can never. Because right. th there's a reason why God builds fellowship. Why He called people to be together. There's a reason why He created us as a relational being. That's right. He says, let us consider how to stir one another. Love. You know why the Bible speaks so much about love? Jesus said in the Gospel of John, the only way people will know we are His disciples is if we have love for one another. Amen. So that's the only way. If it's on display, when people see it, they get to say, I think there's something about these people. They get to see it. But then look at what it says in verse 25. And not neglecting to meet together. It says some of you have developed this bad habit. I don't want to go to church. Why should I go for that fellowship? I am okay. I have my Bible. I can read. I have a TV station. I have subscription. There are preachers on the TV. There are preachers on the radio. I'm okay. I can do all of this by myself. Why should I go? Say so some of you have developed that bad habit and you need to stop it. Why? Because I want you to meet together. Because that's where encouragement and power and strength and fellowship comes from. So you say some of you have already developed this habit. I don't want to meet. You know why some of you enjoy and just want to stay in your homes and tune onto the TV stations? It's because most of the preachers on those TV stations say the things that you want to hear, not the things you need to hear. All right. the, the preachers were standing and say, I see in the spirit there's someone sitting in that sitting room there. You're watching me right now. And God is telling you the blessing you've been crying for is coming. Now, as you see the number running here, please send the seed of faith to claim this blessing in Jesus' name. And you are like, yes, before you know it, you've sent your rent money. <laughs> but that's what some of you want to hear. But God has called us to proclaim what you need to hear. And you need to hear that you are a sinner and that Jesus Christ died and you need him. Amen. That's the gospel. Some of you don't want to come here because the message makes you uncomfortable. Yes. But God has never called us to make people comfortable. He's called us to prepare them for heaven. And to be prepared for heaven means we need to tell you, you are a sinner, you need Jesus Christ, and without believing in Him, when you die, you're going to hell. That's the gospel. So it says, don't stop meeting together. Some of you have developed this habit. Stop it, he says. So that's a call to us. Stop it. If you're one of those who say, well, why should I even go? I'm okay. After all, I don't like those people anyway. After all, they, oh, at least here they tell me how I can be rich. See, one thing that, that COVID really did, and I thank God for it, somehow COVID purified the church in a, in a way. You know, there are a lot of preachers who were preaching wealth and health and prosperity and visas and traveling the world and claiming America and claiming, you know, all of those things. When COVID happened, the airport is closed, yeah. embassies are closed, yeah. and everything, so they didn't have a message to preach. Because yeah. you say, come to Jesus, so we sit so you can get a visa. Where are you going to get the visa from? Embassies are closed, so you can go. How are you going to go? The airports are closed. And so they were quiet. They couldn't sell their holy water. Holy water was not important anymore. They needed sanitizer. <laughs> and so people started knowing, okay, wait, they used to tell us all of these things. So, so this, this mighty man of God and mighty women of God who could do anything also now have to rely on a mask. Yeah. That's where the truth of the gospel came. 
Only those who were preaching Christ and Him crucified still had a message to preach because the gospel of Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever because He is the same. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a message that everyone needs to hear. Whether they are rich or they are poor, whether they are black or they are white, they have traveled the world or they have not traveled the world, they are educated or not educated, everyone needs Jesus. That's the gospel. Now they've started coming back with the economy open. They started, you see, you, and they said, the demons brought COVID that messed up your future for two years. God has released you. Now so we see your faith so you can go to America in Jesus' name. No, God was purifying the church. And the church needs more purification. We need the gospel. So he says, Guys, and, and what do we do? Encourage one another. He says, let's encourage one another. We need to be there for each other. Paul says, he writes to believers in Galatia, he says, if you bite and devour one another, he says, be careful, because you're going to be consumed by each other. And suddenly that's what we're doing in the body of Christ. We are biting and fighting and devouring each other instead of preaching the gospel and doing the work of the Lord. So it says, encourage one another. Why? All the more. So you notice, he says we should just increase in our love for God and His people. We should just increase in the things we do. We should just increase in our encouragement of each other. All the more as the days draw near. So today, we're one day more closer to the return of Jesus Christ than we were yesterday. Amen. This week, we're one week more closer to the return of Jesus Christ than we were last week. So it says, every day that we get to have, we're drawing closer to His return. And we need to be more committed and serious about His work. Yes. And it says, we cannot do that when we're by ourselves. We need each other. That's what a church is. And so now, let's get to look at... Christianity. So who's a Christian? We're talking about a church. Who's a Christian? What does that mean? So he's a Christian. What is a Christian? Anyway. Are we okay? Now, a Christian, someone, first of all, importantly, someone who has been forgiven of his sin or her sin. Someone who has been reconciled back to the Father through Jesus Christ. But I want us to start at this word here, Christian. So when you remove this suffix, the I-A-N, what are you left with? Remove this. You're left with Christ. Now, when I say I'm a Ugandan, or they say I'm an American, well, what does that mean? Well, one, it means they're from America, right? Two, it means they belong in America. But three, it means they represent America. Everything they do is going to reflect on America as a place, but also on Americans and the rest of the people who come from them. Are we together? Just like if I say I'm a Ugandan, I'm saying I come from Uganda, I belong to Uganda, I represent Uganda, but I also represent Ugandans other people like me yeah. and so when we say we are Christian we're saying we come from Christ, Christ but we're saying we belong to Christ we represent Christ but we also represent other people who already belong to Christ yeah. those four things very important that we come from Christ we belong to Christ we represent Christ and we represent other people who are already in Christ very important so how do we do that? How can we belong to Christ? Well, your sin needs to be dealt with. Pastor James mentioned earlier on when John the Baptist in the Gospel of John chapter 1 verse 29 now in the, in the earlier verses from verse 26 the Pharisees ask him, tell us, are you the Messiah who was to come? He says, no, I'm not. So who are you? Says I'm the voice of the one crying in the desert. Prepare the way for the Savior. The Messiah is about to come. It's like okay, so so what's the deal? Says don't worry. After me, there's coming another one who's bigger and better than me. He's 
before me and is so great that I don't even feel worthy to untie his sandal. Verse 29 tells us the next morning, as John was still baptizing and teaching people, Jesus walks right in and John says, guys, pause for a moment. I don't want you to miss this. Luke, he draws that attention to Jesus and says, Luke, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You notice, he takes away the sin of the world. Jesus did not come to take away the poverty of the world yeah. or to make anyone rich. Yeah. Let me ask you, before Jesus came, were there rich people in the world? There were, remember the rich young ruler who came and said, well, what do I have to do so that I can have life? I have everything, just tell me, name the price. Were people getting sick and getting killed before Jesus came? Were people traveling the world at the time? You see, that's what the, the, so if the problem the world had was money and sickness and being able to travel the world, he would have had no need to come because that was already happening. But there's something happening that all of those here, whether they were sick or healthy, they had money or not, they traveled the world or not traveled anywhere at all, they had in common. They were sinners. That's why he came. So he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So how can we be Christian? Well, you must be in Christ. You must believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. You're reconciled to Him through faith. Secondly, a Christian is someone who has reached the end of himself until you are willing to acknowledge all the righteous deeds I can do are as filthy rags before the Lord. And if you can acknowledge that of all that I can do, of all that I can give, there's nothing in me that will ever bring me an inch closer to God. You're not there yet. Chris is someone who has acknowledged that. Reach the end. It's never about me. But God has done this. Therefore, by faith, I receive it. Number three, a Christian is a person who knows that if he died, or if she died, if she were to die right now, she would, with all boldness, stand before the Lord. So I want to ask a question. If you died right now, do you know where you're going? Can you speak with all boldness, like Apostle Paul said, that I know for certain that if I'm absent in this body, I'll be present with the Lord. Can you say that with certainty or not? Because if you cannot answer that, that means you're not a Christian, or at least you think you are, but you're not, because you've not believed in Jesus Christ. Because we can only have that assurance if we've received Him as Lord and Savior. Because when we stand before Him, it is on the basis of what He did for us on the cross. Not on what we've tried to do. So a Christian is a person who knows that, who can stand and in all boldness say, Yes, I know I will enter heaven. Not because of what I have done, but because of what you did for me on the cross. Because I received you as my Lord and Savior. A Christian is someone who by virtue of his relationship or her relationship with God has been reconciled not just to God alone, but also reconciled to God's people. So when God saves us, He does not save us only so that we can escape going to hell. I mentioned that already. He saves us for purpose. Now to help us understand this, let me give an example. Let's say you go out to do adoption. All right, so before that, that kid is in the baby's home or orphanage, wherever, right, they, they didn't have your name and anything. But you go and then once the adoption is done, what happens? This child is brought in your home. This child now is called by the name of the home. But this child is brought into a relationship, not just with the parent, but also with the other children in the family. And the Bible tells us that we were adopted, that God reached out to us and brought us into His household. So not, so we don't just have a relationship with Him as our Father. When He brought us, there are already other children. And now those are our brothers and sisters, and we need to be with them. That's, right. That's why it says you need to have fellowship. 
Because you are in a home, you have a relationship. But a lot of us, this is what we're doing, is like, so you go for that child, you adopt them, and all of that, and then the child tells you, Mom and Dad, thank you. Now I know you are my parents. I know I have brothers. I know how to get you, but I'm not coming home. I'm not coming home, but thank you for giving me a home. In case I'm in trouble, I know where to come, but I'm not coming. Many of us, that's what we're doing. Well, God, thank you for saving me, but those things of fellowship, of serving, of church, uh, I don't want it. But in case I'm in trouble, I know how to get you. Oh, dear Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. That's how we call him. Like, we don't want it. But when God reconciled us to himself, he also reconciled us and created a relationship with the rest of his children. Because we're told he brought us into his household. And so, when we become Christians, becoming a Christian and then we don't want to be part of a fellowship. We don't want to join a local church. We don't want to be part of what God is doing in and through the body of Christ. We're in trouble. Because you see, becoming a Christian and joining a local church is not just for the sake of, well, it's a good habit. It's not just for the sake of, okay, I think if I go, I'll at least hear some word that will encourage me. It's part of a biblical mandate and a command that the Lord gave. And it's part of us being responsible and expressing our love for, to Jesus Christ for what He's done for us. The fact that He's made us a member of His family. That He's brought us and given us new brothers and sisters we didn't know we have. And so it's very important that we are plugged into a local church. That we are plugged into, that is my church, those are my brothers and my sisters, we have fellowship together. It's very important that we do that. So, as we continue looking at this, I want to say this. So if you say you're a believer, you are a Christian, which means this is the claim you're making, and you come from Christ, that you belong to Christ, that you represent Christ, and you represent the rest of the people who belong to Christ, and then you don't have any interest in being part of a local church. You are not willing to commit to a local church. And of course, it has to be a church that has a focus on the, on the gospel. They believe in the gospel. They're teaching the word of God. The content of everything from the message proclaimed to the worship that is offered to the prayer and the fellowship that is done. It is Bible-centered and it's spirit-laid. If you have no desire, you're not committed, you're not interested in any of that at all, we need to question and you you need to question and ask yourself whether you truly belong to the body of Christ at all. Amen. Or you're just claiming, or you're just looking for a social club where you can fit in. Because it's called us to be part of the church for a reason. Again, let, let's get back to our verse. I told you we'll, we'll continue visiting this. It says, let us hold fast Remember, let us hold fast the confession of our faith, of this hope that we have that he, he gave to us. Let us hold fast without wavering, without having doubts, without having a second thought about it. Because he will give the promises faithful. But it says, let us consider how to stir one another up. Love and good works. Let's continue meeting together. Let us encourage one another. And it says all the more as the day is growing in. It's very important that we do this. And so, our state before God, if we're authentic, if the faith we professed in God was authentic, 
if the commitment we made to God is authentic, if the love we profess for God is authentic, it will translate into our daily decisions. That every day we live, we are making it about Him. Even if the process might be slow, even if you might struggle, you might falter and fall a bit, even if there are times where you, 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 you feel you're struggling in your, in your own faith, at the end of it all, the goal and the desires of your heart is going to be, God, help me live for your glory. God, help me today. God, use me today. God, show me how can I live for your glory today. Every decision is going to get to that. It's about Him. If what you made was authentic. A true Christian builds his life or her life and pours it into the life of other believers. And that happens through a concrete fellowship of the local church. You're growing, but you're building your life and you're pouring it into another person. That as we have fellowship, a concrete fellowship, a solid fellowship in what we'd call a local church, that we are serving one another, we are loving one another. And so as we gather together, as we gather to worship the Lord, as we gather to make it about Him, as we exercise the love that is placed in our hearts towards Him and towards one another, as we do the work He's called us to do towards Him and towards one another, we demonstrate in real life that God has truly reconciled us to Himself. And that God has truly reconciled us to one another because He's made us a home. He's made us a family. And so you and I cannot demonstrate love. We cannot demonstrate joy or peace or patience or kindness if we're sitting by ourselves in an island somewhere. We cannot do that. But we demonstrate this love and this joy and this peace and patience and kindness when the people of God are committed together. When we're committed to loving people even when they've given us reasons not to love them. Now we're committed to forgiving even when they've given us reason not to. Because at the end of it all, the love of Christ compels us to make it about Him. So as we wind up, as we wind up on this who a Christian is, we see that a, the gospel is displayed in the midst of a group of sinners who have committed to loving one another. It is displayed in the midst of a group of sinners. We're all sinners here. We're all sinners. If you go to a church and they're all saints, don't go to that church because you'll mess it up. We're all sinners. Saved by God's grace. Sustained by God's grace. So being worked on by God's grace. The only, the only church we're going to get to and it's made of sins and there's no power of sin, no presence of sin and, and no penalty of sin completely is when we're in the church in heaven. That community church in heaven where we're going to have people of all tribes and people and nations and languages in one place worshiping the Lord. Then the Bible gives us a glimpse in Revelation 4 and 5 that everyone joining the angels that they call, this one says, holy and holy and holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and needs, and needs to come. And then it says, this other group responds, no, 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 let me help you. He's holy and holy and holy the Lord God Almighty who was and needs that needs to come and he says they respond again and says day and night they're worshiping him and some of you don't want to worship God when he's given us opportunity well, what we're doing here is rehearsals Amen. for what we're going to do in eternity Amen. and some of you come and sound like this it's like you're in vigilators oh. you know some in vigilators are what they do as people are taking papers And, and some, some of the people would be having chewing gum. And 
people, people are worshiping the Lord. We're just doing rehearsals. What are you going to do in heaven when you don't know how to worship Him? Yeah. You've never worshiped Him. You've never done it one moment. And, and yet, for eternity, that's what we're going to do. Yeah. You see, I believe that there's a lot of things that the reason why they, 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 they keep just echoing the same, I think because of His glorious grace and the radiance and, and who He is, they keep discovering something they didn't know about. He's like, oh my goodness, glory, He's holy and holy. And then they finish the other one and say, no, 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 I've just seen something. Let me tell you, He's holy and holy. And He says, day and night. Yeah. He says, we're supposed to be in this fellowship to learn that, to encourage one another, to prepare for that. And so together we can display the gospel of Jesus Christ in a way that we cannot do by ourselves. Together as each one of us exercise the spiritual gift we have. Together. Being a Christian means caring about the life and about the health of the body of Christ because we belong to that body. That we are caring for His church. It means caring for what the church is and caring for what the church should be and being committed to it because we belong to it. This is our home and we want our home to be the best it can be. We want when other people visit our home to be able to say, man, you, you guys have really, I love the way you take care of your home. We want it to be, but we don't want to feel when, when friends say, oh, by the way, I wanted to come and visit, say, uh, no, can we try and... Because you don't want them to come because you're not proud of your home. Because you've not done what you need to do for your home to be good. And so lastly, we care for the church because it is the very body of our Savior Jesus Christ. Let's look at what Jesus said in Acts. You remember this? Chapter 9, so Paul, of course, is breathing serious persecution against the church. He's gotten letters from authority. He's moving at this point as far as Damascus to arrest believers and bring them into prison and drug them. But then the, 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 he gets this encounter with the Lord. And then the Lord says to him, Soul, soul, why do you persecute me? Because Saul says, when he felt the drink, he heard that voice, why are you persecuting me? At this point, remember, Christ had already gone back to heaven. But he identified with the church. He identified with what was happening to his body. And he says, why are you persecuting me? So he said, he asked, who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Are you seeing the connection there? That if we say we are Christian, we are from Christ, we belong to Christ, we are connected to Him, we represent Him. Christ actually takes that serious. So when the church was being persecuted, it says, you are persecuting me. Amen. Amen. You're not of your own. You belong to Him, just like the rest of us. And that's why He says, we are a body. As we go through this week, let's think about these things. Ask yourself, what has been stopping you from being committed into a local church? What excuse have you been giving for not serving, for not being part of it? Because you see, as we're seeing, it's not the responsibility of three, four, five, or six people. It's all of us. We're a body. And God has given you a gift. And God wants that gift used for His glory and for the building up of the body. So it's not just a few people who should be. All of us should be. So ask yourself this week, what has been stopping you? Maybe what excuse have you been giving? Is it justifiable before the Lord? The excuse you're giving, can you give that same excuse to the Lord Himself? Can you stand before the Lord and say, Well, you see the reason why I don't go, the reason why I don't do this, it is because of this. And it's a legit reason. 
So whatever excuse you're giving, whatever reason you have, make sure it's justifiable before the Lord. You first tell Him. If He confirms and say, Oh yeah, that makes sense. It is okay. I have understood. So please don't go. Please don't do it. Please don't serve. If the Lord tells you it is okay, let us see how we can encourage one another. Stir one another up. As we build the body of Christ to what it's supposed to be for His glory. Shall we pray together? Lord, we are thankful for Your Word and thankful for salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray that You grow in our hearts a burden for You and for Your work. That You encourage our hearts to be part of a fellowship that we will commit to a local church, that we will commit to a cashier and, and be willing to allow you to use us for your glory as we encourage one another in the process. In Jesus' name, amen.